Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, listeners, uh, and uh, welcome once again. Uh, today we have with us a guest. His name is Rob Henderson, and he is the best-selling author of a book entitled Troubled, a memoir of foster care, family, and social class. He grew up in foster homes in uh, Los Angeles and the rural town of Red Bluff, California. He enlisted in the Air Force at the age of 17 and subsequently attended Yale University or Yale College on the GI Bill and was then awarded the Gates Cambridge Scholarship to study at the University of Cambridge in England, where he obtained a Ph.D. in psychology in 2022. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Boston Globe, amongst other outlets, and his newsletter is sent each week to more than 50,000 subscribers. So with all that, um, welcome, Rob, and let's talk. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Thanks, Lisa and Joseph. It's great to be here. Well, I um, had your book on my uh, virtual nightstand for a long time, Rob. I'd been looking forward to its publication. And then I follow you on what used to be called Twitter <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and noticed that you were, you were reading some Jung. And I thought, well, this, this, this is going to be a really interesting conversation. So I, I thought we could kind of talk about the intersection of your interests, your research mm-hmm. interests, and, and what you've been writing on in the past several years, as well as your personal experience and, and uh, Jungian psychology and see what, what veins there are to mine there. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's, I've been sort of dipping in and out of Jung for maybe the last year, year and a half. Um, and yeah, I find it fascinating. It's such a different way of understanding the human mind uh, than what I'm used to coming out of mm-hmm. you know, kind of this um, academic psychology. I was you know, research assistant as an undergrad and you know, psychology has really attempted to fashion itself into a science, I think, with maybe a limited, limited success. <laughs> um, and so for that reason, a- among others, I- I've become more curious about sort of going back to the roots of mm-hmm. where psychology started, um, back to the psychoanalysts, back to Freud, back to Jung, and seeing what I can, what I can glean um, from, from these uh, thinkers. And would you mind just telling us a little bit about what you have been, uh, what your research focus is or or what, you know, what your, what your work has been focused on? Uh, Just tell us a little bit about that from the other side of the uh, psychology field. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I did a PhD at the University of Cambridge, um, studied kind of social personality psychology. Um, My PhD thesis was uh, building on some of the work from Jonathan Haidt in moral psychology, moral mm-hmm. foundations theory, um, you know, that period uh, in the midst of my PhD, the pandemic was ongoing. And so I became interested in kind of the relationship between um, COVID and disgust and morality and those kinds mm-hmm. of things. And so um, I was working on my PhD during that time and ran some online studies and you know did the whole sort of analysis wrote up the results i got a couple of peer-reviewed papers published during that time um and you know i read a lot about personality kind of personality psychology as it's taught in many departments now the big five the hexaco model and and then later you know uh, learned about the myers-briggs and and some of those other approaches and you know throughout the this time i was reading a lot about social class social status uh, this preoccupation 
people tend to have for uh, being held in high regard by other people mm-hmm. and where that stems from and how uh, it, this feeling, this desire seems to be more pronounced in some people than others. There were two papers that were published when I was still a student. These were both published, I believe, in 2020. And both of these papers found that um, essentially the higher status, the higher social class people are, the stronger their desire for wealth and status. And so, you know, these researchers collected objective me- measures of one's position in society. So uh, wealth, uh, income, occupational prestige, level of education, and then asked participants questions, you know, the extent to which they agreed with statements like, uh, it would please me to be in a position of power over others. I enjoy when people uh, look up when I enter a room and so on. And essentially, the higher people scored on those objective measures, the more likely they were to agree <laughs> with those uh, uh, statements about being interested in power and recognition and so on. And that helped me to um, put some of the puzzle pieces together as far as what I was seeing at um, particularly at elite university campuses, places like Cambridge, uh, places like Yale, um, where you know I, I had come from a completely different environment before setting foot on campus. And so, of course, I was interested in psychology and social class and status from uh, an intellectual standpoint, but also from kind of a personal one as well, given my experiences kind of traveling along the class ladder. Mm. So, Rob, this may be a good time to just offer to our readers a little bit of your story that you captured in your book, Troubled. Um, Some of the listeners may not have necessarily read your book, and that might contextualize some of your comments. So I know this is rather difficult to (laughs) create a synopsis of such a large arc, but can you tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah, well, so the book uh, Troubled, it came out in February, and, you know, it it was kind of six years Uh, in the making, this process of getting this book written and then published. And then I struggled a lot with it, but, you know, I, so, so we've, we've discussed a little bit, you know, I, I have this degree from, from Cambridge studied at Yale, but before these, um, you know, before entering these elite universities, my life was a lot different. Um, so to just back way up, I was born in Los Angeles, uh, into poverty, um, never knew my father, my uh, mother, you know, we were homeless for a time shortly after I was born. We lived in a car. Eventually, we um, settled in this slum apartment in LA. And my mom became heavily addicted to drugs. And when I was three years old, I was taken from her care and placed into the Los Angeles County foster care system, uh, where I lived in seven different homes um, and was eventually adopted. And, you know, during this, this time, some forensic psychologists actually um, interviewed my birth mother and asked her, um, where's this boy's father? Uh, because you're clearly not in a position to care for him. And she said she didn't know where my father was. And so my mother, she was from Seoul, from South Korea, and that was not her first run in with law enforcement. And so she was deported back to Korea and I was born in the U.S. I was an American citizen. And so I got stuck in the foster care system. And yeah, I never did learn about my father. I actually took a, a 23andMe, one of these genetic ancestry tests, um, and discovered that I'm, I'm half Mexican on my father's side. So my father was Hispanic. My mother was Korean. Um, and you know, the, the joke that I've, I've sometimes told is, you know, I, I wish I'd known about that side of my, my family when I was applying to college. Um, <laughs> that might have been, that might have been helpful. Um, it ended up working out anyway. Um, and so eventually I was adopted by this working class family in Northern California. This was the late nineties. Uh, so I was, I was eight, eight or nine years old when my, uh, we, my adoptive family, uh, we settled in a town called Red Bluff, working class town. And, you know, it was uh, an intact sort of stable family for a time. And then they subsequently divorced about 18 months after, uh, the adoption. And I lost contact with my adoptive father and 
you know, I, I delve into the details in the book of just how much drama there was and family mm -hmm. tragedies and financial catastrophes. Mm -hmm. And and this was not at all uncommon. Um, you know, later, once I became old enough and read about the research and the sociological data on kind of blue collar working class towns across the country, um, you know, family fragmentation is a um, widespread phenomenon. And I describe some of the lives of my friends in my book as well and how they came from similar backgrounds as myself and how their lives ended up. And it really was um, kind of a half impulsive decision. I got out of there, enlisted as soon as I could when I was 17 um, and left for the Air Force where I was enlisted for eight years. And, you know, I, I learned a lot while I was there. It was in in the military, although there were some setbacks and some struggles there as well, and then eventually got my way into uh, Yale on the GI Bill. And so, yeah, I've had a lot of unusual experiences for someone with the education that I have. And so I spent quite a bit of time sharing my observations and um, reflections on social mobility uh, in the book. Mm -hmm. So given the breadth of your experience and also the suffering that you had overcome, why do you think that you had focused on this idea of status, opportunity, luxury beliefs? For instance, you could easily have decided that uh, research into trauma uh, mm -hmm. or childhood trauma equally would have been a, your purview having, having experienced that. But what, what funneled your interest particularly into this kind of socioeconomic and privilege dynamic? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think one possibility, you know, is, is that I did sort of have that, that experience of being born, you know, about, about as poor as you could be in a developed kind of first world country. Um, so I started uh, about as low as you can start in terms of socioeconomic status. And then by the time I was adopted, you know, I, I'd witnessed the kind of working class, lower middle class environment. Then by the time I got to the military and I had kind of more middle class friends, and then I get mm -hmm. to Yale and had friends who were more sort of upper middle or upper class. And so I really saw, you know, uh, kind of the, the, the broadest spectrum of socioeconomic status that you could see uh, in the U.S. And yeah, all along the way, I, I you know, put these, I attempted to put these pieces together, these differences I was seeing, not just in terms of money, um, but also in terms of family structure, in terms of cultural capital, social capital, who gets access to what and who doesn't. Uh, and then in my own experience, I'm sure, you know, you, you mentioned childhood trauma. There's probably a piece there where I myself was seeking regard from other people because I had so little of it in the foster homes and, and from my birth mother. I don't, I mentioned in the book, I have two memories of her. Um, but you know, my, you know, your, the body remembers, right? So even if I don't necessarily consciously have the experience of remembrance of my mother and, and our interactions, um, my guess was she was not exactly 100% present. And then in all of the foster homes, there were sort of varying degrees of neglect. Um, and then in my adoptive family, there were, was, you know, less than adequate supervision uh, at home as well. And so later, you know, when I joined the military and you know, achieved a bit of success for myself and realized how I, I felt differently about myself, how other people looked at me. Um, and I wanted to understand that too. Um, what was that that uh, led me to experience that transformation and why um, that seems to be such a fundamental drive for people? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that in a way, uh, what Joseph has um, articulated might be uh, likened to two sides of a coin, heads and tails, that trauma and social class are very much intertwined. And uh, that poverty and uh, lots of changes of caregivers, um, inadequate uh, educational experiences, perhaps you could put anything you want into that category, are, are in effect um, aspects of childhood trauma. They're mm -hmm. not the only ones, but, um, you know, if you are living in a car 
or have had multiple caregivers in the foster through the foster, quote, care, unquote, system, um, there's a relationship there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the other piece was that um, shortly before my first deployment, on, on a whim, this was sort of my, my uh, first step towards studying psychology. I picked up this book from the Harvard psychologist, Steven Pinker. This was, this was 2012. Um, and you know, the title got my attention. It was just called how the mind works. Very simple title. And you know, I was 20, I think it was 22 at that time. I thought, Oh, how does the mind work? You know, I, I was about to go on a long flight and spend six months in another country and figured out oh, here's a thick, dense book that might uh, occupy my, my time. And there was a passage in there uh, that I mentioned in, the, in, in Troubled about how Pinker points out that, yeah, this is a fundamental drive. And he gives all of the kind of synonyms of status, uh, you know, esteem, recognition, prestige, regard, so on and so forth. And, um, you know, this is something that that uh, people people long for and and pursue. And um, and yeah, I wondered, how, you know, is it, you know, because Pinker claimed it was universal and I think, you know, was, is it universal? In my case, it seems to be true. And yeah, once once I started to learn about how uh, you could actually study these things empirically, um, you know, I led me down the path of, you know, studying it in a more formal way in, in college and then later in, in grad school. You know, um, it's interesting because we, we've had this national discourse on diversity and most of that has been focused on, on, on race, uh, and maybe a few other parameters, but I feel like class has often dropped out yes. of the discussion. Uh, so it, it's uh, refreshing to kind of read about it. And as I've been reading some about class in your book and in some other books too, I, I've you know felt very uh, you know called out. <laughs> I, I was sharing before we started recording, Rob, that you have this uh, a line in your book about uh, which which you're quoting from another author about how educated people like to name their pets you know things like Clytemnestra, and I was like, oh <laughs> man, that's Ooh, that hits really <laughs> close to home, but 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 I guess my point my point is that um, in in reading these books, your book and others, it's like it it's bringing to consciousness something that that I've done that I've aligned with that's been very egocentric. That's been you know I haven't it, it feels comfortable to me, for example, to want to name my pets after some you know literary illusion. Um, and, and without recognizing that what I'm doing is signaling um, prestige or class. But of course, I, I, once it's pointed out to me, it's mm -hmm. like, well, maybe your you know, predilection for organic foods isn't just about you know, wanting to eat healthy. Maybe, maybe it's also a signifier of class or prestige. And I mean, then there's a thousand other things, right? What I, what I read, what I, uh, what I, what I value. And I, I can see how, uh, you know, it's in some sense, um, it's just been the brine I've been pickled in that I don't question, that I don't think about it, that I don't relate. And, and of course, I think that this is what some people mean when they talk about privilege, you know, mm -hmm. sort of white privilege, that there's just things I take for granted. Um, and yet I, I, I think it certainly, certainly that, that, that concept has some uh, has a lot of validity, and and I th and I think that in making it just about race, we're obscuring something about class too. So mm -hmm. I'm reaching for something. I don't know that I'm landing on it, but um, no, I think you're you're right. I just had this conversation recently with a friend of mine. He's a professor, and he's on uh, some diversity organization at his university. And he told me the other day that he, you know, everyone was discussing these different categories of diversity, and he brought up class. And, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, politely nodded and then moved right back to talking about these other categories and really expressed no interest in pursuing more class diversity, um, which I find fascinating. Um, and yeah, I, I was shocked when I arrived at Yale <laughs> of just how little interest there was in, in class and how, you know, this, this is probably, I mean, you know, of course there are various forms of um marginalization and victimization and so on um but i think for most people if you you know you had to be um 
if you had the choice, I think very few people would choose the, the, the one where you didn't actually have enough material resources. Um, that seems to be you know, particularly difficult uh, to, to talk about. And, you know, I just had this conversation with a, with a friend of mine. He's a, he's a professor and he also researches class and he somehow he, he managed to collect these data from a business school. Um, and he uh, recorded these kinds of conversations among the students and their interactions and basically found that, um, you know, despite the fact that there are various forms of marginalized identities, the students were relatively open in terms of describing their identities in terms of um, ethnicity or gender or sexual orientation and so on. But he said the one that the students very much uh, avoided um, divulging was class. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, the wealthy students didn't want to talk about their wealth. Right. The poor right. students didn't want to talk about their uh, impoverished backgrounds. No one wants to talk about money, uh, which I right. find fascinating. It, it, I think maybe it does kind of stem from this. Maybe, maybe it just stems from this American belief that class doesn't exist and that we're right. all kind of we're all middle class, you know. Right, yes. right. So exactly. It's funny to just to, to go back to Canada Goose Jackets. I have a friend whose whose daughter was actually at Yale and uh, my, my friend had actually been given in some promotion or something that's having to do with her job. She actually had a Canada Goose Jacket and her daughter needed a jacket. <laughs> so my friend was like, you know, take this jacket. And I was like, Mom, I cannot wear that, you know, because it yeah. because it signified um, this sort of degree of uh, elitism. You know, elitism exactly <laughs> and so she wouldn't wear it it's just so funny so yeah. and you know it's like do you want to do you want to signal that you have money because that's what most people have wanted to do throughout history mm -hmm. you know i i actually i actually love reading kind of old novels you know from this like the 17th and 18th century and a lot of those novels are all about like who's got money and how do you know and how nice a house does Mr. Darcy have and, and all of this stuff, right? There's a lot of that. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of, it's always been with us, you know? Um, but nowadays it's almost fashionable not to signal that you have material advantage. Mm -hmm, so it, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. And, you know, I, I, I spend some time in, in the book dwelling on this point that class is not just about money. It is about these, uh, more subtle signifiers yeah. of your interests, your tastes, your hobbies, where you went to school, which university you graduated from, and, and what uh, um, disciplines or, or majors you studied. Uh, Paul Fussell I, writes about this in, in his great book, Class, A Guy Through the American Status System, that, you know, the, kind of the more useless the subject, the, the higher the, the class background. <laughs> And, and I noticed this, that, uh, you know, when I was in college, the, the students who were, uh, for example, a disproportionate number of the ones who were headed off to medical school were from immigrant backgrounds. Yep. You know, they knew that they were going to have a job as a physician, whereas the students who were legacies or who were sort of comfortably um, upper, upper middle class, you know, they were interested in studying topics that didn't necessarily have uh, a job waiting for them or a, or a confirmed job at the end, uh, something a bit a bit more abstract. Um, and so, you know, I, I found that interesting. And, um, you know, I, I also, you know, I, when, when I was in uh, uh, Switzerland recently um, and I visited, I visited Jung's house in, in Kusnacht, but I decided to pick up a, uh, a book that was uh, you know, less, less serious, say, than something like How the Mind Works or, or Paul, Paul Fussell. I read um, this book, China Rich Girlfriend by uh, Kevin Kwan. Uh, so this is the sequel to Crazy Rich Asians, which some some okay. of your listeners may be familiar with. It was that that it was a big movie that came out yes. uh, five or six years ago. So this is the sequel to that. It's it's the novel, and one of the points in the book, uh, you know, one of the characters is talking about how he always felt poor growing up, uh, despite the fact that his family was obscenely wealthy. And the reason he said is because um, they drove drove an old car, and the, their their uh, dishware uh, had chips, you know, little little sort of imperfections. And so on, and uh, and and their furniture was old, and later someone had to explain to him, no, like that's how that's how this uh, um, that's how legacy wealth works. You have antique furniture, you have old dishware, you drive a beat up car. Like this is just how you perform your class. That's and it's it's similar actually. So this was in Singapore, where the, where the story takes place, but it's the same in America too, where 
kind of these old blue blooded wasps, you know, they'll drive a, a BMW from 1988 and have kind of frayed collars on their suits. Um, and and that's how you can kind of tell that this is not new money. New money drives a Lexus and has the flashy Brooks Brothers and, and wears a, a Rolex. Uh, the old yeah. money, they don't they don't they don't signal their class in that way. That's fascinating. I mean, mm -hmm. this has always been with us. Right. And mm -hmm. I think it's it's true that we don't talk about it. And 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 one of the things that's been floating around the edges of our conversation, I feel like for the past few minutes that I'll just go ahead and land is the association between Jungian psychology and class. You know, mm. Jung grew up, I would say, kind of maybe middle class. I would um, his say his father less... was a pastor and kind of in a rural place. But he married the second richest woman in Switzerland. Yes. And mm. his, you know, didn't have to worry about money after that. And uh, you know, the 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 group that grew around him were very, you know, especially as he became more renowned, were very moneyed foreigners, many of them, including the Mellons. It's very, very expensive to train to become an analyst. Uh, it, being in analysis is, is generally very expensive. Uh, and, and talk about y y the point you made earlier about, you know, sort of um, fringe interests. You know, I mean, boy. You know, alchemy, anyone? I mean, <laughs> uh, so, so I, you, you know, that's something I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that operates in, in my little corner of the world and kind of curious about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I think that that's right, that it's, it's expensive to become an analyst and it's expensive to receive the analysis as well. Um, I had dinner the other day with a friend who was uh, explaining to me that he, so he's older, he's an older, uh, gentleman, ultra high net worth. And he was telling, he, cre you know, it's interesting that we're having this conversation now because he told me he credits his financial success to psychoanalysis. Uh, so <laughs> he's been, and, and he goes, to, so he lives in New York and he goes through like the old school, like Freudian, uh, cause I asked him like, like, are you talking about like on the couch? Like the whole, like, and he said, yes, that's, you know, he's been doing it for what, 15, 20 years now. And he says like that uh, allowed him to, you know, access parts of himself he was unaware of and made him a better businessman and so on and so forth. And uh, and I, you know, as he's explaining this to me, you know, I did I did think that, um, you know, because he, he came from a pretty well off family to begin with and, and sort of took what he had and made even more. And, you know, if, if it's if there's if it's the case that there's a causal link between the sort of psychoanalysis and and then earning lots of money. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, very few people would have the option to do the analysis in order to make the money in the first place. Right. So there are these, these barriers in place. Um, and it's, it's, it's the case for, for all forms of education, really, um, just how, how difficult it is to, to acquire and, and, um, yeah, these in, in, invisible obstacles. So Rob, as you have spent time through your personal experience and then also your education, bringing forward the significance of status and class. And I'd like you to talk at some point about luxury beliefs specifically, which is a wonderful term that you had mm. created to describe a phenomena. Um, is this something that we must simply become aware of and accept? Or do you have a sense of that anything could be done or even should be done around this? secondary to being more aware of it. Our Patreon has had a makeover. There's lots of new content and ways to engage with us. Patrons who support us at the $5 level and up will now access Young Love, weekly bonus episodes where the three of us discuss dreams and questions sent in by supporters. At the $10 level, you can vote on topics for podcast episodes and vote on which guests we invite. And at the $25 level, you'll also be able to watch behind-the-scenes content and even join us for occasional live events. If you'd like to be a part of all this, the link to our Patreon is in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, there's, there was a great book on this uh, topic a couple of years ago by Will Storr, The Status Game. And he talks about three types of games. Uh, that we play for status. Uh, he talks about uh, dominance games, and this is the the most sort of archaic form of status competition. And he cites 
you know, animal research and, you know, basically it's expressions of violence, of bullying and coercion and so on. And he says, you know, in the, in, in the modern world and polite society, we don't necessarily have as much of this, but you can see it in, in sports or you can see it in street gangs or mafias or militaries and this kind of thing. Um, and then he talks about uh, virtue games, um, you know, essentially uh, attempting to outdo others in terms of moral character. Some people might use this term kind of virtue signaling, how, you know, one is more holier than thou. Uh, and he talks about success games of, you know, basically doing very well in your education and your career, um, you know, uh, obtaining awards and accolades and so on. And, you know, he says you know, to varying degrees, um, you know, we're, we're probably going to play at least one of these games in one form or another. And, you know, I, I think we, uh, you know, we can, we can be aware that we have this desire, but we can also be aware of which game we want to play as well. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with the kind of virtue games of attempting to become a better version of yourself and attempt to improve the world. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, on the luxury beliefs point, uh, which maybe we could get into later of how just because your intentions are good doesn't mean the outcomes are going to be good. Um, you know, it's very easy to mistake affect and the the warm glow you feel from expressing an opinion or attempting to implement a policy for um how how efficient and how effective and you know th those those policies will be so i think that's that's worth knowing uh as well and you know i've likened this desire for status to something like hunger where all of us to varying degrees experience hunger the intensity kind of varies from person to person and how much we desire it varies food i mean and and it's the same with status i think you know i think it does kind of fall along that normal distribution where the intensity of that desire uh is different from person to person um you know i think for someone like me you know i'm i'm interested in studying it and and uh, uh my my guess is people who are interested in studying something like this probably have a higher than average desire for it um <laughs> <laughs> and and others don't, you know. I I notice this with um, you know, my friends that I grew up around uh, from back home. Of course, like they they experience their own versions of status games and so on, but it's not nearly to the same extent um, as I see among more kind of educated people. Uh, although it's it's more subtle, it's 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 pervasive. So, so it seems like this is something we can become aware of. Mm -hmm. What that awareness will do remains to be seen. Will that deconstruct the potency of it because as Jungians and as psychoanalysts, that's one of the things we assume mm. that when something is unconscious, it exerts a disproportionate amount of influence and we justify it or we barely recognize it by becoming more aware of it. Then we can become more choiceful around it perhaps, mm. or at mm. least it becomes an object to consider rather than kind of a subterranean engine that's pushing us right and left. So in one way, being aware of anything makes us have a little bit more room, breathing room around it. I think that's just, just right. I've I, spoken. Yeah. No, go ahead, Rob. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, I, I've noticed this with, with uh, people who become more aware of this desire for status that, you know, the, especially overachievers who are prone to burnout, that they say yes to everything and they're, they want to get every award. They want to get every, um, piece of recognition they possibly can. And then once they recognize, oh, this stems from this desire that I was unaware of that, you know, they can, they can still feel it, but they're more willing to ignore it. Right. Um, so right. I think maybe, maybe in terms of the feeling, I don't know how much control we have, but in terms of the actions we take, maybe we do have a bit more agency over it. Exactly. I think that when we, um, okay, I'll just finish this thought. Yeah, Lisa, yeah, yeah. But, Go ahead. Um, when we become what I think Joseph is pointing to uh, is when we become aware of something and it's in consciousness, then we can choose. So, okay, I was really driven by this desire to um, get the Chamber of Commerce Award or to buy a different kind of car. Once I'm really aware of what that's, where that is in me, then I can say, oh, wait a minute. Uh, as Joseph said, it becomes an object. It's out there. I can, I can walk around it a little bit, look at it. Uh, and then say, well, I don't know. Um, 
maybe I don't really need that. Maybe it's the it can affect our our choices. And um, altogether, one hopes it is basically freeing us mm. into more awareness, more wholeness. Um, and whether that leads to a lot more money, like the person you were talking to in New York, or whether mm. that leads to, you know, um, I think I'll go out and, uh, you know, sort of water the vegetables in the garden. Mm. It, it can, we have choices. I can choose. I'm not grasp uh gripped by by something uh like that underground engine joseph was talking about that just runs things at, at least that's the hope yeah i mean, joseph i think you've raised something really interesting and we obviously all have a lot to say about it i wanted to link it to the idea of kind of persona and shadow because uh and i i, I appreciate rob your framing about these different kinds of games so if we're playing um you you said there was a there was a virtue game and an achievement game. Let's say we're, yeah. let's say we're playing the achievement game. Mm -hmm. So what we've identified with what's um, to use that psychobabble term, uh, kind of ego syntonic, which it feels right to us. Uh, that would be what, what is in the persona, how we want to, how we want others to perceive us. So I'm very diligent. I work really hard. I win the awards. I'm smart. I'm competent. I'm focused, whatever. But, there's also always something that's going to be in the shadow that we're going to disavow that's going to be the kind of opposite of that. So that might be, well, I'm, I'm grasping and I'm, um, you know, petty and I'm cutthroat or, or whatever might be the sort of shadow side. So if you think about it, maybe the, the virtue stuff, well, I'm, I care about the environment and I care mm -hmm. about diversity and I care about other people, but what's in the shadow is, you know, maybe, you know, it's really important that people see me like this and I'm going to vie for being the, the most virtuous. And even if that means I'm going to have to cut some other people down. Or, so, mm -hmm. so I think it's, it, you know, I really appreciate the question you asked, Joseph. It's like, well, so what can we do about this? Mm -hmm. And I think if we, if we translate it into Jungian terms, one of the things that we can do is say, all right, so... So virtue is important to me or achievement's important to me or power is important to me. Okay, that's okay. And what's going to be left in the shadow that I might then act out unconsciously or project onto other people? So I think we're talking about the various ways that these insights might be applied in terms of our personal self-reflection. Yeah. How we might try to create some sense of balance and, and mm. put something into our hands in terms of consideration. Mm. I think as Jungians, one of the things that we're also very interested in is that differentiation between the authentic self and then the values that we are colonized by. And, and in an ideal analysis, that begins to become really apparent. So I don't know that infants are born with a natural sense of status per se, but there is a certain kind of competitive desire to thrive. And if we're in an environment where thriving or the ones who are thriving have certain statuses, there is something deeply instinctive that says, well, I'm going to thrive if I identify with this group versus the group that doesn't seem to be thriving. If that was demonstrated with something other than status, we would then be attenuated to those things, you know, people with a certain hair color or certain in a physical build, all of which, depending on the environment you live in, is something that's, uh, that's noticed for sure. But often we are looking for any evidence of what the structure of the personality is underneath that. So I'm wondering that in your own process, because your book is autobiographical. And so something inside of you prompted you to examine how you became the man that you have become. And often when we do that, it's because we sense there is a secret in the narrative that we haven't quite put together, we haven't quite found. And often that secret is something that is more authentic 
more true than the trauma we've been subject to, more authentic than what we've been colonized by. And in order to make that separation between who am I really versus what's been done to me, who am I really versus what's colonized me, then it still leaves that important question of who am I when I separate out these other things? So this is a personal question, Rob. Having done this investigative work, mm. what parts of the most authentic Rob have, have clarified for you as you've become aware of the impact of these various things? Huh. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's difficult to say. Um... You know, as as I as I was writing the book, um, you know, it's, it's so so writing memoirs is, is is challenging because it's still telling it's still storytelling, and you still have to give the reader a sense of coherence, and you can't just tell one story after the other of this happened and then this happened and so on. It has to sort of have a connective tissue throughout so that the reader doesn't get lost or, or out, keep asking, well, what's the point of this? Why are you telling me mm. these stories? Mm. Um, one thing that became apparent to me, uh, well, I guess there were, there were two. Uh, one was that I, I was always kind of a curious kid. Um, I had always been interested in abstract ideas and, um, I had this thirst for knowledge. Um, for information, for wisdom, and uh, I was in this kind of, uh, uh, and I don't know, intellectual drought in these environments, mm. in foster care, and, and then later in this working class town that I had grown up in of, you know, my friends that I had around me, um, you know, they were, I was probably the most academically inclined uh, among them, and even I was just barely passing my classes. I graduated high school with a 2.2 GPA, C minus student. Um, and I think a part of me uh, was maybe uh, afraid of that um, mm -hmm. propensity of uh, that I was a pretty bright kid. Um, but if I acknowledged that about myself, then I would have had to raise my sights for my future. And I just, you know, I didn't feel uh, worthy somehow of it. And uh, there's, there was a story I left out of the book, actually. So very early on, uh, shortly after I uh, enlisted, I arrived at my first duty station in Washington State. This was McCord Air Force Base. Um, my uh, uh, supervisor noticed my test scores and my just general enthusiasm. I just threw myself into the job and I was doing very well in terms of the training. And he suggested to me that we put a package together, an application to maybe um, for, for essentially for me to apply for the Air Force Academy uh, and sort of fa get fast tracked into becoming an officer. And this is like, you know, it's very rare for a young enlisted kid to be offered something like this. And I was I think I was 18, maybe 19 at this point. And, and I just said no. <laughs> like, I didn't even think about it. I was like, oh, no, thanks. Like, I'm good. And, um, you know, it's funny, just I made the right decision by enlisting, but then threw away this uh, opportunity uh, simply because I just didn't feel mm -hmm. worthy of it. And I didn't really I felt like, oh, I've I've all it was something like I've, I've already gotten pretty far. Like the fact that I made it through all the training, I'm doing well right now. Right. Maybe this is about as good as I can hope for. Maybe I've sort of reached the ceiling as far as what I'm capable of what I could hope for myself. And maybe some part of me thought I didn't even deserve that. Um, and then, so, so I, I, I declined that. And the other was just, uh, the, the other lesson I suppose was, you know, through, through authoring those early experiences all the way up till fairly recently. Um, I could pinpoint the moments when I actually exerted some agency, uh, and made my own decisions. And realize that, you know, there are all these uncontrollable forces that govern our lives and 
that yeah, we, you know, there, there, there is limited control that we can exert, but there is some. It's not, it's not zero. And I can tell, oh, that was a moment when I made a decision and and it went well, and there, there was a moment where I made a decision and it went poorly. Uh, and so that just reinforced for me that that that's still it's it's true, not just for these stories that I'm telling in the book, but also for my actual life right now that. I can exert some some agency and and not just feel subject to external forces. You also mention, um, you know, you have just mentioned, and it's in the book about uh, the relationship to class and ease. You mm. know, are we? You know, are are you at ease saying, "Oh yeah, great, I'll go to the, I could go to the Air Force Academy and I could become an officer." Um, of how many different worlds we're comfortable in, in lots of respects, uh, mm-hmm. but especially that world of, of class, of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, could I, could I really go to a university like Yale? Um, and we could literalize it of, am I comfortable living abroad for a year? Um, mm-hmm. Am I comfortable trying something new that seems beyond my reach? Uh, out of my comfort zone, uh, uh, it comes up. I think in a lot of ways, especially and including the interior realm, of mm-hmm. to what extent can I feel my feelings and examine myself, uh, read these books and have these encounters, and mm-hmm. and push my own boundaries, inner boundaries and outer world boundaries, mm. versus you know, hey, I'm good. <laughs> And I, th- I think, um, Deb, what, what, uh, what the sociological literature says, which I'm not super familiar with, so I'm sort of making this up, but is that um, that issue of ease that you just pinpointed, that's pretty much what upper middle class parents try to confer to their children, even mm-hmm. kind of unconsciously, like, we're going to give you broadening experiences, we're going to... Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to you're going to spend the summer, you know, on a college campus or you're going to spend some time abroad. And like, that's what we're doing. Right. Is that we're conferring ease. And I I think, um, Rob, some somewhere in the book you mentioned, and I think you were quoting Paul Fussell about um, what what puts you into to the the upper class, I suppose, is having at least one parent who went to college. Do I have that? Is that Mm -hmm. my recalling that correctly? Mm -hmm. And and I have had I have some analysands who were raised poor. And it's a thing. It's a whole thing because there's so much shame and that kind of lack of ease and never feeling worthy. And I was, I, I saw, I saw uh, one of these people, you know, in the past week or so. And I, I said, I said, can you just remind me? Did one of your parents go to college? She said no. And I said, yep. And we were we were talking about this how how hard won her ease has been, which brings me back to a question that I have for you. You said, oh, no, thanks, not the Air Force mm-hmm. Academy. How, a few years later, did you think, yeah, Yale, yeah. what, ha- what changed in you to allow you to inhabit that possibility? Hmm. Yeah, I, by that point, I was 24 years old. Um, I'd done quite a bit of self-work. You know, I, I describe in the book how... I was in rehab and, you know, received some therapy and had read a lot of books. And by that point, um, you know, I'd been in for six or seven years in the Air Force and I'd had a lot of leadership experiences and traveled a lot. And, um, you know, without fail, you know, all of my performance reports were, um, you know, exceedingly good. And so... Um, I think all of those experiences collectively just, you know, gradually informed me that, you know, I'm, I'm actually a pretty competent person and that, you know, if I were going to start from square one and, you know, essentially go back to college and be 25 years old with a bunch of 18 year olds that I at least wanted to, to shoot as high as I could. Um, and so, yeah, I, I went to, to Yale and, uh, you no, know, and it wasn't a. An, it, I didn't feel the ease when I got there, which I describe in the yeah, book. Yeah. You know, this kind of fish out of water experience of being around a bunch of students who had, you know, gone to expensive private boarding schools and had essentially trained their whole lives to go to a university like that and who knew how to handle 
um, the reading load and the kind of subtleties of what it meant to do well in a class versus not. And, you know, so when I was in high school, a B was a good grade. Oh, you get an A, A is great and a B is good and a C is average. You know, that's the kind of template. And then at Yale, it was uh, an A is good and an A minus is bad. <laughs> and I didn't, and then, and then like, you know, a, a B plus is like, you didn't really go to class and you kind of put in a half-hearted effort. And I didn't know this. <laughs> And so so no one fails at these universities, elite universities. The reason they have such high graduation rates is you have to try to fail. Everyone graduates. But then there are these subtleties of, you know, a 3.7 GPA means this and a 3.9 means that. And everyone feels like on paper, you know, everything looks great. But of course, um, you know, these these metrics get corrupted. And so students start to stress out over the difference between an A and an A minus and then um, how to handle the reading load. Um, and the, uh, the assignments and just all of it, the students just knew how to do it. Uh, and of course, not only had they personally sort of trained through their own educational experiences, but they had friends, you know, oh, my older brother went to Yale mm -hmm. and he gave me the notes yep. for this class already. Um, sure. so I have a Google doc with everything I need to know for this class because, you know, my friend graduated from here last year or whatever it was. And I had no connections to the university like that. And so. All of those things made it difficult on the academic front and then on the kind of social front too. <laughs> learning how to get along with these students who were not only much younger than me, but uh, had had completely different life experiences where, you know, by the time I was 18 years old, I had worked a series of jobs and and, you know, had enlisted in all this. And, you know, a lot of these, you know, they they'd never worked a job. They'd never paid taxes, anything like that. They were just kids still. And. You know, I, I, I noted in the book about how our standard for what counts as an adult versus a kid, um, that varies based on class that, mm -hmm. you know, a 20 year old who uh, never goes to college and maybe goes straight into the workforce or uh, joins the military, that's an adult. But if you're a 20 year old on a college campus, you're still a kid. And, you know, I saw some of, you know, we saw a bit of this recently with some of the, the demonstrations on college campuses. and. I'm seeing people say, oh, you know, these these Harvard Law students, they're just a bunch of kids. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, like, if you're 27 years old at Harvard Law, you're you get to be a kid until you're 27. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, when do you get to become an adult then? And uh, and so the college just seemed to prolong adolescence uh, and, and then grad school and so on. And so um, although I was 25, I was still relatively young. I felt I felt old. <laughs> And uh, what I what I sometimes say is I, I actually kind of aged in reverse because each additional semester and each year that I was on campus, I sort of shed that old kind of military attitude and just sort of, you know, uh, uh, gradually uh, assimilated into the academic environment and became, you know, a student. And and uh, it was actually nice, a nice uh, uh, to, mm. to have that experience. Rob, uh, when I was listening to your. Uh your book, and it was nice that you narrated it yourself because I felt like you were talking to me as I was listening to the audio book. One of the things that I heard in your book is the transition between things not mattering to things mattering. And so people who have been raised in traumatogenic homes, people that have been raised with few choices and a tremendous amount of suffering, one of the ways that they defend against despair is to say, it doesn't matter. Mm. Mm. It, it, it doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. It's a way of kind of dismissing or coding things in a kind of mist so that we're not plagued by them. Um, this is a very common defense that children uh, discover as a coping mechanism mm. for some people that that can still haunt them well into adulthood or they can collapse back into it in the face of adversity, which of course makes them very vulnerable. But one of the things that happened in your life is that things began to matter. Mm. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to that transition from things not mattering the things really mattering, which then changes your relationship to your life and to the choices around you. Hmm. Well, you know, early on in my life, 
know, everything was so fleeting and unstable uh, that, like you'd mentioned, I think there is a kind of protective function there of, okay, so I'm moving to another home now. Well, you know, eventually you just sort of, I, I learned to shut off my feelings and just accept it and go to the next home. And there's, I mean, those early chapters of the book were, were difficult to write. Mm-hmm. Not not necessarily the experiences themselves, but because of the lack of um, power or agency, that sort of feeling of powerlessness and vulnerability. Um, I, I didn't expect that to be so difficult to um, uh, delve into and and write about. And so just having all of my, um, every aspect of my life, you know, taken like that of, oh, you're living here now, or, or I would befriend one of my foster siblings and then they would be taken mm-hmm. and I would have no say or no uh, input at all it was just, um, you know, it was devastating for a little kid. And so, mm-hmm. and, and then each time, um, you know, something positive happened in my life, it always seemed like, you know, right around the corner, uh, the catastrophe was waiting. And so, uh, I think this started to change for me probably once, once I, I, uh, left home and I mean, it, it probably started actually once I got a job and, mm. uh, realized that, you know, I was being held accountable, uh, for something and, you know, even something as simple as, you know, I was, I was a dishwasher. So it wasn't like the highest stakes jobs in the world, but I, you know, I, 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 I had a place to be and I was earning money for it. And so that was kind of step one of, oh, like there's this reliable relationship between inputs and outputs of I do this and then this happens. Um, And so something here does matter. And then later when I left home, joined the military, same kind of experience, just at a kind of higher stakes um, and realizing that other people relied on me and that what I did um, had consequences mm. eventually towards the end of, uh, of troubled, uh, and, and, you know, I was 20 years old by the time I had this realization was, you know, early on I'd spent, especially my teenage years and early adulthood. I think this is actually a common experience because I've had a few people describe this to me of how to become self-reliant, self-sufficient. You don't want to depend on anyone. You don't want to rely on anyone. You want to be your own person. And maybe that's, adaptive during those early adult years of learning how to become a self-sufficient person. Uh, but eventually, um, once I was able to do that for myself, uh, and realized ultimately it was unfulfilling to just be, um, on some level selfish, uh, just, it's all about me and what can I do and what can I experience and putting my own needs first. Um, Thinking about my adoptive family, about my mother and my sister and mm-hmm. and then my own future family of, you know, now that I've become self-sufficient now, how do I become that reliable person? How can I become a dependable person? Um, and that seemed to me uh, a more fulfilling path. And so I've been working on it. I'm not like I'm not all the way there yet, but I've I've been trying no, to become right. a better brother, better son and all that. And mm-hmm. uh yeah, and it, and it's it is it is more fulfilling. That's a great question, Joseph. And I, I'm Rabbi. Just say I'm looking at my highlights. Um, I highlighted the sentence: "The military asked that I put myself in the service of something higher than myself." Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's right. That uh, you know, d- demanding something of people is actually. Uh, can actually be beneficial. I mean, when you're when you're a small child, small tasks. I tell this story about how I had these. My my adoptive mother. She was in a relationship with a woman named Shelley, and how they had these chores for me, and how I'd argue about that these chores. And but but it was actually good for me. Uh, at the time, I didn't realize that I was just a kid. But um, in hindsight, you know, just the feeling that I was contributing to the house, to my family. And, um, you know, those, those moments meant, uh, you know, those are the memories that I have. Those are the things that I remember, um, that played, Mm -hmm. I think an outsized role in my, my, uh, youth. 
I'm thinking about how your outer world journey so parallels the inner world journey of, uh, and, and what happens to a kid who, you know, you're powerless and you're just not even seen. Mm. Uh, how you're going to feel about moving to another home doesn't really even, it's not even part of the picture. Um, it's just going to happen. Uh, or one of your, uh, you know, foster siblings is is moved to another home of that unseen quality and and then that journey that you took to um you know from a jungian perspective we would call ego development of uh, mm. i i've been tasked with certain chores at home and i have to do them um people keep uh telling me that i can do this or i should strive for that um and we get to that place of competence uh in the world and self-reliance and mm -hmm. we want in the first half of life for everybody to develop uh, ego strength, something that's flexible and competent and so on. And, and then that the next, that other place of in midlife of, you know, what, what am I really doing? I, I, I uh, uh, accomplished the tasks of the first half of life. Mm -hmm. Now I can reflect. I can think about relationships. Uh, um, I can consider other aspects of myself. Uh, and how do I become a better, you know, from my point of view, how do we become a better grandmother, wife, uh, citizen in the world? Mm. And, and that's a very different trajectory from the status. You know, that's still an external world orientation. How do people see me? You know, am I driving uh, the right kind of car or mm -hmm. uh, wearing the, quote, right kind of clothes, unquote, of mm -hmm. that we hope that there will be that place of self-reflection and self-acceptance and the ability to know oneself and then be generous and generative uh, in the world and to people we care about. Rob, how did you learn how to regulate your intense feelings? There's stories of you being a young kid <laughs> and having quite a temper and just popping somebody in the eye, you know, who uh, provoked you. And, um, and here today in our conversation, you're a very, um, a very quiet, thoughtful person. And that had to be earned, I imagine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, that's, that's right. I mean, well, well, part of it is just getting older. Um, you know, I, <laughs> yeah, I, and then uh, there's that. <laughs> right. Yeah, very, very few, I think people are as confrontational at, in their thirties as they are in their teens. And so, you know, I, of course, you know, I, I, that was just, uh, how that, you know, I think this, this may in, in itself be a kind of characteristic of, of class of just the willingness of young males to be hostile and ready to go physically um at a moment's notice and you know with with time with um maturity and you know all the experiences i had later in the military and so on i think i you know i just learned to you know men you know i mentioned earlier like i i felt the feelings but i can choose a different way uh and i still have that <laughs> um and you know and sometimes it's just I think it's just luck. I mean, weirdly, the, so the other day I was walking just, where was I? I was just walking and taking a walk outside and I locked eyes with this guy on his bicycle. It's almost like, you know, it's funny. I, I have this, a, a very similar scene in my book, this guy on a bridge riding a bicycle and then oh, yeah, he yeah. attempts to, so almost similar circumstances, weirdly enough, but I'm, I'm recovering from an injury right now. And he stops and he says, why are you looking at me? He gets right in my face and says, why are you looking at me? And I don't know if you're allowed to swear on this podcast, but you I say are. get the F out of my face. But inside, I'm like, man, like I'm injured. That was not the right thing to say. But then fortunately, another guy walks by and sees that we're in this kind of verbal altercation. And he kind of, you know, just a completely strange, you know, strange person, you know, walking by saying, hey, what's going on here? Just, you know, you guys get out of here. What are you doing? Because I actually live in a pretty nice neighborhood. But this guy who was on a bicycle was probably not. He just probably doesn't live here. Um, so, you know, occasionally things happen. Um, but, 
I think if that had happened when I was 17, that would have just been, you know, <laughs> one or both of us would have had the police called and it would have turned into <laughs> something else. Uh, and so anyway, um, generally, I think it is just um, getting older and and attempting to exert some self-control. And uh, and I, the other thing is. Part of it is. And, you know, this uh, this is it's not so much about the individual, but the environment. And what I mean by that is if you're in a place full of people like how I was when I was a teenager, even if you aren't necessarily an aggressive person, you will find yourself in altercations with people who are seeking it out the way that this guy probably was on his bike. Um, but if you're in a nice neighborhood where people have money and people have lived relatively safe and comfortable lives, um, you know, you just don't ever find yourself in a position where confrontation like that could happen in the first place. And so even if you are a confrontational type, um, it just never occurs in your world. And so I've, I've noticed that too, that ever since I've went off to college, everyone's so nice. <laughs> everyone is so like, I mean, they're if physically, you know, they're, they're polite. And, you know, of course there's like verbal backbiting and rumors and gossip. There are other ways that aggression is expressed, Yes. but, in, but physically no one ever wants to fight. And that's kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is. It's a relief. Yeah. yeah. Before we started recording, you mentioned uh, the hero's journey and that someone had pointed out to you that that kind of was a template for your experiences. Do you identify with that? Is that something that speaks to you? Um, yeah, I, a friend of mine, he'd read an early version of the manuscript um, and he said, you know, this is a hero's journey. And I asked him what that was. He re referenced uh, Joseph Campbell. I flipped a bit through um, Hero with a Thousand Faces. Yeah. And then that was actually one of um, the the avenues that took me to Jung. And um, because I realized that, you know, the, the hero's journey idea, Campbell popularized it, but I guess he was sort of drawing on uh, ideas that were original to Jung. I don't I don't know, I don't know if I identify with it. Um, you know, it's it's because it, it seems so uh, at least the, the the Campbell version, it just seems so uh, fantastical. Um, and so I guess I just have a, a little bit of difficulty connecting the um, the the more uh, mythical and fantastical elements to the kind of concrete realities. Um, but I suppose if I, you know, if I if I attempt to sort of draw those parallels, I can see some of it, um, you know, the 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 connection between, you know, starting in one place and ending up in another, the. You know, even even at the very end of my book where I attempt to what is it like re return with the elixir? I didn't know what this exactly. is what I was doing, but yes. just um, what did I learn through all of this? And then here, yep. you know, here's what uh, here's the information. Here's the, the quote unquote treasure um, that I've discovered, that kind of thing. So I can see that there's that uh, the, I, I can see the parallels to some extent. I think part of it is the parallel between first and second half of life tasks. Uh, that I just touched on a little while ago, of that the hero's journey is about getting out into the world. Uh, and it's uh, in mythology, it might be slaying the dragon or finding the water of life, the elixir, or, you know, it's imaged in many, many different ways. And that then the return in the second half of life is, uh, uh, it's not quite so magical as, hey, everybody, guess what? Here's the elixir. But it, it is a turning inward. Uh, and being oneself and having oneself uh, to offer to others. Mm. Uh, th that I'm, I'm here. It's not so much all I can do and all the skills I have and uh, achieving more and uh, um, you know, buying better cars or bigger houses, but a sense mm. of... Uh, self-reflection, self-knowledge, and being present. And that, mm. that that's, that's what we really do have to offer others in the final analysis. All, all we have is ourselves. Whatever we do, we do with ourselves. Mm. And yeah. uh, we have to get out there and learn in the world and from the world. Uh, and then we have to get in here mm. uh, and become ourselves. Uh, in a way that takes reflection um, and self-knowledge. Hmm. 
Yeah, one of the um, uh, concerns that I had early on when I was writing this book was uh, if anyone would connect with it, uh, mm. because I've had such an unusual set of experiences, and most people aren't particularly familiar with the foster care system or the kind of neighborhood that I grew up in in Red Bluff and you know all of the details that I share there. And so I wondered if this would be so far removed from people's reality, the reader's reality, that it just wouldn't hold their interest. But my understanding of the, the hero's journey is that it's supposed to be universal, that uh, it's a template that everyone can understand. And so, you know, I guess that that is one thing that I've been surprised by is people who have had very different life experiences from me can still connect with the story. And, you know, maybe they come from a more um, comfortable life background, wealthier, what have you, but they had a parent who was an alcoholic or they had a uh, family tragedy or unexpected uh, catastrophe of one form or another. And through that, they're able to, you know, that's kind of a portal for them to understand the, mm -hmm. the experiences that I share. And so, yeah, from that uh, perspective, I can see that the hero's journey is, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there is a, a universal element to it. And the flip side of, of the hero's journey, I think, is uh, the archetype of the orphan. Oh. And these, these are universal human themes, both of those things of feeling, you know, alone and unseen. And uh, am I going to make it that, uh, you know, so I'm not at all surprised that people relate to your journey. Um, hmm. Because it's part of so many inner world journeys that people who may have grown up in materially more fortunate circumstances, um, nonetheless, these are human, uh, human themes and human experiences. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, to the, your comment, Deb, about the archetype of the orphan, there was that one moment, I think it was when you were the woman who made you clean the pool was that Miss Martinez? Is that right? Yeah, it's yeah. a really Dickensian kind of villain, and and you describe a neighbor walking by and sort of checking in on you, and then just continuing to walk, and you had this realization: I'm really alone. I think I think that's I think I'm recalling that correctly. That's right. Yeah, but that you know that is that that moment I think that you're getting to Deb, that that of an existential awareness of our aloneness in the world, which is a terrible, terrible thing to have to feel as you did, Rob, as a young child. And yet there, there is something about knowing that that can set us on a path because we recognize that we're the only ones who are going to make a difference in our lives. So mm -hmm. there, there can be a way that it's clarifying to know that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes people will say, um, you know, that, that, uh, you know, being, being, a, they, they talk about the wonder of being a child or they say that, uh, being a teenager, these are the best years and so on. And, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe generally speaking, that's true, but, um, I'm just so grateful to be an adult <laughs> and yeah. to just have yes. that control over my life. And I remember even, even uh, as a 17, 18 year old kid, just moving away from everything. And, and even though I was in this very rigid structure uh, of all these rules and so on and regulations in the military organization and that hierarchy, um, there was a predictability there. And I sort of knew what I could get away with and what I couldn't and having the boundaries and knowing how much agency I could exert and so on. It was just really freeing. Um, and then, yeah, later, I needed all eight of those years, you know, to Joseph's earlier question of how I, you know, sort of evolved and matured over time was just I needed all eight of those years to finally become a functional adult so that by the time I was 25 and started college and, you know, yeah, all these kids, they want to go, you know, uh, party and drink and, oh, there's exams tomorrow, but I can still get six hours sleep as long as we get home by this time. And I'm like, I'm just, you know, I, I, I had no interest in that. And you know, to realize that, you know, how to, how to manage my time, all of those things. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, having, having full control in that way is just so nice. Yeah. Well, one other place that I'd, I'd like to go if we can is, uh, going back a little bit, for example, to what, what, how, how do we understand class from a Jungian perspective or what the heck 
and a Jungian perspective bring to this discussion is it seems to me that, uh, you know, perhaps an interest in alchemy or astrology or myth uh, is, is a little arcane and uh, inaccessible perhaps to some. I mean, Jung is difficult to read to. Um, but the need for meaning transcends class. That truly is universal. And, and Jung, of course, does try to address what is universal in the human spirit. And so I, I do like to think that uh, Jungian psychology does have um, some medicine for us all and perhaps can serve to unite us or broaden our perspective uh, and, and help us perhaps to feel more into the plight of others who have had very different experiences from us and, uh, you know, and, and, and what to do about the larger structural issues that make Jungian analysis uh, difficult to access. I, I don't know that I have any um, startling uh, insights about that, but I, I, I did just want to touch on that briefly. And I I wonder, I mean, I think it's been in our discussion somewhat, Rob, because you talked about um, kind of recognizing that you could be a better person, you could be in, in service to something larger, which, and I think that's often where meaning springs from. You know, you said, I'm going to be a better son or a better, or a better brother. Um, uh, you know, it's, um, yeah, that, that's just really in our DNA as humans, I think, to the need to feel connect yoked to the larger purpose and maybe i'll stop meandering there and see if anyone wants to add something so i feel like we're uh, trying to create some kind of a bridge from rob's narrative his his autobiography to some jungian concepts he's done a bit of that work for us by talking about the hero's myth in a nutshell the hero's myth in general, is that movement from dependency upon a parental figure to full autonomy and gaining whatever skills one needs in order to be in the world effectively and dynamically. And that can be imagined in any number of different myths, fairy tales, whether it's Star Wars or whether it's um, the Fisher King, one thing or another. But the way of imagining the transition from childhood to adulthood, I think the hero's journey in some ways is appropriate in as much as some of the archaic scenes of struggle, which to many modern psyches don't seem relevant, are very relevant to people who have been raised in traumatizing environments. Because in many of the myths, the hero is struggling for their lives. They're struggling against monsters. They're struggling against adversity that most modern folks wouldn't necessarily imagine. But when we're raised in very averse environments, it's not uncommon for a child to be fighting for their life, fighting to get enough food, fighting to get away from a monstrous adult. And what does one need to find in order to either escape or overcome? those experiences. And when I think about some of the things that you described in your book, as you were saying, you wondered whether anybody could identify, for instance, having a mother who just ties you to a chair and just leaves you for extended periods of time. For some people, that seems like a strange, horrible myth, but it isn't. But often in these ancient myths, those stories of remarkable challenges remain. So it often is in that mythic realm that we can still have a feeling for extraordinary adversity that is overcome, and that the triumph of the hero is that he is often wounded, but he wins in as much as he emerges potent enough, accomplished enough, and able to command some sense of success and autonomy in the world and not become a monster himself, which is one of the terrible challenges, of course, is that children are always at risk for becoming 
what has been done to them, to become their adversaries. We see that sometimes in these shows like Batman, you know, these the Marvel comics. You know, why does Batman, who's been subject to terrible things, decide he's going to be a hero versus many of the uh, criminals, the, the dark figures, were exposed to terrible things and they became nefarious and dangerous. So often it's the hero's archetype, Jung might say, activates inside of the human psyche and provides a frame of meaning that points a way out of over-identifying with the adversity. It points to this feeling of overcoming the adversary instead of becoming the adversary. And in that way, it protects a, provides a kind of psychological shield so that eventually we select what is better, ultimately more functional, but also better in terms of how to situate in the social environment. Deb had pointed out perhaps the archetype of the orphan, which we also see in fairy tales and myths, and the journey, yes, that journey from deprivation and isolation, often to relationship. The heroic journey of the orphan is to go from being alone to being coupled, to, to forging the relationships that were not demonstrated in the childhood that we discover we can attach. We can want someone close to us rather than reel back out of fear they're going to do something terrible to us. I mean, that's the orphan's hero journey, is the ability to love and be loved, which is something some people can take for granted. But for those who have not had that demonstrated to them, that is a heroic feat to love and be loved. So these universal stories can illuminate certain tasks. And I would suspect reading your book that some of these themes could interestingly lean into your narrative as they do to all who have overcome remarkable adversity. One thing that, uh, that, that came to mind as you were speaking, Joseph, is... Uh... You know, I mentioned before about the hero's journey and how I, I did have some difficulty connecting those mythical and fantastical elements to the kind of more mundane realities that I'm describing in my book. But I, I don't. I maybe maybe Jung writes about this, or or some of his um, his uh, his disciples of just. I, I wonder if these myths, these stories, are are more if if they're written almost as a way to to communicate those mundane realities in a in a in a more sort of accessible and 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 almost less traumatic form um because mm -hmm. you know uh, one thing that one piece of feedback i get from some readers is how difficult it is for them to read about a child being mistreated by an adult um mm -hmm. and i understand that uh and but if you're reading about a store a, a story of a, of a child fighting a dragon or something it's the same story, but just somehow it is less um, upsetting to read about. Uh, and I wonder if if that if if myth also kind of serves that purpose. Um, but again, I'm 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 uh, I'm merely a student of of, of Jung and of, of mythology in general, so I don't really know. But I I, I wonder about that. That uh, you know the, the, these stories are. Are ways to do that. I, I think in a way it kind of translates it into a higher register, which makes mm -hmm. it um, universal. And because it's, so it's not just a single person's story of triumphing over adversity, it's, it's the potential of the human spirit to triumph over adversity. And, and also it makes it mythological and therefore like symbolic, you know? Mm. Um, so we're, we're in the, we're in a, a, a realm that has a lot of, um, uh, resonance rather rather than just being the concrete story and and so there are layers of meaning there because it's because it's symbolic but um and i think it does make it more 
pa- palatable in a way palatable, or, yeah. or fu- like a way to find a way in, but also feels relevant to all of us. Mm. Depersonalizes it by making it universal and then consequently can be looked at in the same way that all metaphor, in a sense, is slightly distancing. It can expand the language around how we can describe an experience, but it also gives us a little bit of a buffer when we say, oh, it's just like this. Well, mm. we're, we're slightly moving a few inches away from the thing, which um, mm. it can give us a poetic shield around the rawness of the actual experience. Mm. It's also mm. myths and fairy tales because they, they survive because there is something in the story that most human beings still resonate with. That's because so many things disappear. I mean, we can't imagine a thousand years ago, but all of the flotsam and jetsam that's in a culture of stories being tell, told, why do a handful of the stories seem to propagate from culture to culture for a thousand years? There must be something that the general human personality can recognize as a universal. And often, It's because myths and fairy tales also solve something on that symbolic level. And whether it's, you know, the capacity to hold on to hope in hopeless situations or the ability to aspire. But there's a wonderful uh, quote that I like by um, an essayist um, called Chesterton. And he writes, Fairy tales do not tell children that dragons exist. Children already know that dragons exist. Fairy tales tell children the dragons can be killed. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So it gives us an orientation in that mythic world to possibilities that a child might not imagine. Mm. So as you are tied up in that chair, you are Hansel in Hansel and Gretel, where the witches put you in a cage. Mm and wondering how you're going to get out of the cage mm. in the witch's cottage. So there are universals. This idea of children feeling bound and trapped is something that shows up in fairy tales that are hundreds, if not a thousand years old, because mm. it is a thing that happens either symbolically or quite literally in the world. Mm. How does the human spirit orient to that? so that we can find a way out of even the memory of it, let alone the actual physical experience. And and of course, you are charting that and have been charting it. Mm. And your story is a way of kind of getting through a Hansel and Gretel story without being eaten by the witch. Mm. So that these these, um, metaphors of fairy tales, we can find threads that allow us Mm. to hold and to imagine it, even from a somewhat different aesthetic. There's such a link between the individual and the universal stories, you know, uh, so that you know, fairy tales and uh, various mythological themes uh, you can, can seem outlandish and out there, but uh, over and over again, they, as, as we see in an individual story like your book, the theme of you can do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it they're imp- it's a theme of empowerment. Um, mm-hmm. You have the right stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do. You can do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and conquer, conquer the witch, or Cinderella goes to the ball. Um, as the, of empowering uh, different uh, facets of empowerment that are within us. Mm. And and that's what, you know, that it's in you, whoever that you happens to be. Uh, so um, what, you know, what Joseph said of the uh, building hope. Mm. I'm, I'm going to take us in a totally different direction for a sure. minute. Because I'm, I'm thinking, Rob, of something you said earlier, and I can't remember if we were recording or not, but you said, like, most of the people who grow up in your situation uh, are not going to turn out like you do. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, 
you were you you talked a little bit in the book about who's the book for, what's the message, and in some sense, you know, you've said I don't want the message to be, you know, you should have hope, because just kind of statistically, most people who grow mm-hmm. up in that environment are not going to go to Yale or get a PhD, and and so, uh, you know, I I really heard the cry in in your book that uh, there are there are policies and norms that can, uh, let's say, soften or, or mitigate the effects of, let's say, poverty. And that in some sense, uh, you know, we've, we've abandoned some of those over the past 50 years or so. So I want to give you mm. a chance to talk a little bit about luxury beliefs, because I know mm. that that's, you know, kind of a, a special area of yours. Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, you know, despite my efforts, you know, I, I, I do still receive emails from people who have had similar lives to me, some even worse, who actually did um, find my book to be a source of hope for them. And I, and I think that's actually okay. You know, I guess what yes, I, of course my, 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 <laughs> my fear was that, um, uh, more materially uh, uh, prosperous, educated people would come away with it thinking, uh, well, this guy did it, so why doesn't everyone else just get their act together and mm-hmm. work really hard and turn their life around like he did? Um, but, of course, if people like me, the way that I grew up, if they read it and, 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 and you know, start to rethink some of their everyday decisions and habits and practices and find my book to be a source of meaning and hope that's great so um yeah the luxury beliefs idea it started to take shape in my mind shortly after i arrived on campus in 2015 i arrived at yale at a very unusual uh time in terms of uh the ongoing debates the very contentious debates around the nature of higher ed and what the purpose of a university educator and what these communities are meant to do, what their aims are. And so at, at Yale in 2015, maybe some of your listeners would be familiar with what became known as the Halloween costume controversy at Yale. Um, you know, very long yeah. story short, you know, I, I got out of the military in August, started class in September. And then in October, shortly before Halloween, uh, you know, the Yale administration released this email saying, uh, you know, don't, you know, be wary of what, you know, be, be, be mindful of what you wear for your costume this Halloween, kind of uh, issuing this warning against cultural appropriation, be sensitive, so on. And then one of the professors at Yale, she was what, what were then they were called masters and associate masters. She was an associate master of a residential college on campus. She sent an email to her students, you know, essentially challenging this idea that you know, telling these students, hey, you're all adults. You know, if you want to wear what you want to wear for Halloween, that's fine. And, you know, if you have an issue with it, just speak amongst yourselves. We don't need Yale bureaucratic um, guidelines telling us what we should and shouldn't wear. And in response to this very innocuous email, uh, and, I, and it wasn't, I read that email four or five times attempting to discern just what was so offensive about it. And to this day, I'm still not, I, I can, I, like, I can kind of understand because I've been so immersed in these environments that I can almost see it. But even then, it's, it's hard. At that point, I had no idea. And in response to that email, there was this eruption on campus and hundreds of students were marching around campus calling for her to be fired, her husband who defended her, they wanted him to be fired as well. He was also a professor on campus. Um, and, you know, that was, I don't know, six or eight weeks into my first semester. And, you know, I, so that was uh, a very shocking introduction to higher ed. And then when I would ask students to explain just what, it, what, what was the offense here, uh, they would get upset with me for asking that question. And 
one student, I tell this story in the book, uh, I asked this question and she responded by saying I was too privileged to understand the depth of the pain these professors had caused. Um, and I knew that she had attended a, <laughs> an expensive private boarding school and she was, <laughs> you know, you know, kind of a very kind of conventional Yale student. Um, but she was trained to think about privilege in a very narrow way. And so that's, that was a response to my question. Um, and then I would have other kinds of questions or, or conversations with students and ask them different kinds of questions and realize they had completely different life experiences from me. And I'm not just talking about undergrads, by the way. You know, I worked in a psychology lab where there were plenty of grad students who were running um, the day-to-day -day operations of the, you know, conducting studies and so on. These were PhD students and postdocs. And I would speak with professors and administrators and kind of all across uh, the university, I would hear views around family uh, or around, you know, the, the, the standard line on campus was that um, all families are equal and that, um, you know, I, ideally we could get beyond uh, this idea of married parenting and find new ways to experiment with family formation. And yet when I would ask, you know, these students, um, what, how, how they were raised, they would tell me they were raised by two married parents. And then when I would ask them, well, how do you plan to have your family? You know, if you plan on having one and they would tell me, oh, you know, I was raised by two married parents and I'll probably do the same for my kids. But, you know, that's not just cause I want to do it that way. It doesn't mean that's how people should do it. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, growing up the way that I had and seeing the kind of family uh, fragmentation I had seen, I was you know, essentially hearing these people say, you know, I benefited from this very um, stable family structure and I plan to carry it forward for my own kids. But officially, my stance is people shouldn't do this. Um, and then I, I learned that the vast majority of the students on campus had come from very stable family backgrounds. So it was it wasn't just a matter of uh, money. I, I knew going in that a lot of these students would come from very affluent backgrounds. But then when I realized that essentially every single one of them had been raised by two married parents and then realized, you know, I compare that with my friends that I grew up with in high school and how. I had five close friends growing up, and of the six of us, none of us were raised um, by two married parents. Uh, that that couldn't be a coincidence. That you know, I had friends who ended up in prison or shot, and you know, they had one kind of family, and then these other students who had different kind of family, they ended up at a place like Yale, and it was just hard for me to reconcile this um, without and sort of adopt this view that many of these. Um, Yale students had that this thing is just completely unimportant and has no kind of predictive power in terms of your life course and outcomes. Um, same things like, uh, like drug decriminalization. Um, you know, the line was that, you know, drugs should be completely decriminalized. Um, I found that hard to accept as well because of my own experiences with substance abuse and a lot of the people that I grew up around. And I cite statistics in the book, too, that I, 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 you know, some readers would have been surprised by that actually the um, perhaps counterintuitively, the more education someone has, the more likely they are to support drug decriminalization. Um, and same with all of these other things, you know, family formation. Um, and uh, another example is. Um, selling addictive technology to people while <laughs> exerting very careful norms at home about screen use. Um, and so there seemed to be this duplicity on campus. And so eventually I, I, I coined this term luxury beliefs, ideas and opinions that confer status on the upper class while inflicting costs on the lower classes. And, you know, this, this can take the form of policy. Um, I write, some, some, at some length in the book about defund the police and the consequences of that movement. Um, and, you know, it's funny, like, the defund the police movement, there, there was a, an increase in violent crime. And from 2020 to about 2022, you would occasionally see some news coverage of this. You'd open the pages of the Wall Street Journal 
and you would see oh, year over year, crime, you know, violent crime has increased X percent since 2020, something along those lines. Um, but then uh, within the last maybe year or so, uh, there have been very high profile cases of uh, there, were, there, were, there was a journalist who was killed in Philadelphia, another journalist that was killed in New York City, a tech entrepreneur who was stabbed in San Francisco. And so now, you know, there, there, people are starting to recognize that this attitude toward law enforcement has unraveled and it's starting to reach, um, you know, people who ordinarily wouldn't be uh, murdered. And these people, people like you know, journalists and tech entrepreneurs, they received um, entire articles written about them. And, you know, to me, this was an interesting double standard where if you are a poor person who gets killed, you get folded into these statistics. But if you are uh, a member of the modern aristocracy, you get an entire article written about you and how you were killed and what your career was and the kinds of things that you were interested in. You, you know, you um, are treated uh, in a very different way. So, um, you know, I, I flesh out the idea, um, drawing on yeah, people we've, we talked about Paul Fussell. Uh, I draw on Thorsten Veblen, who wrote this classic text in socio uh, sociology, The Theory of the Leisure Class. Pierre Bourdieu, who wrote this book, Distinction, a Social Critique of the Judgment of Taste. And he writes about cultural capital. He writes about how people perform their social class. Um, they convert their material resources into um, arcane and intricate knowledge um, you know, not, you know, about wine, about art, about maybe alchemy uh, and, <laughs> exactly <laughs> and and this is, and, and essentially they're subcommunicating you know when they tell you about uh, you know the the exotic locales they've traveled to or um, you know how how this vintage is is you know different from that they're you know kind of subcommunicating that I'm a, I grew up in these circumstances in this community in this environment went to these kinds of schools and so on and my claim is that luxury beliefs um, are one expression of that. Uh, if you adopt the view of, um, you know, if, if the conventional view is it's good to have police, you know, probably a good idea to get married before you have kids. Um, there should be some laws around drug use. If that's conventional opinion, a good way to stand out from the masses is to adopt the opposite view on those things. And it signals sophistication. It signals that you probably went to a pretty expensive college and you read um, certain periodicals and so on and so forth. Um, and so some of this is arose out of my own personal experiences. You know, sometimes I'll go home and talk to my mom and say, Alice, have you heard of this acronym or that new movement or this, that and the other? And she's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, what are they teaching you at these places? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, there's just this, it, and my mom is, she's a working class Democrat, right? She's voted Democrats her whole life. So this isn't a political issue. I think it really is about class more so than, than about politics or something like that. And, and maybe also it's about the danger of conflating uh, the ability to conceptualize of mm -hmm. that, wait a minute, should we rise above our uh, usual concepts around law enforcement, for example? And let's just think about something different and how it could be better or or uh, less regulated and and concretized. Uh, mm -hmm. And we conflate that with, you know, sort of empirical realities um, around the need for regulation or mm -hmm. the empirical realities about um, uh, married couples who then have children and continue to have stable households. That tends to do better for uh, for kids' uh, opportunities and successes in life, and that th mm -hmm. there's just a difference between what we can think of and conceptualize, and what actually tends to work for most people most of the time um, in the so-called real world. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I hope um, you know I, I haven't received these accusations, but I do hope you know when people read the book that I I'm not trying to be this finger wagging moralist or something. You know, I, I grew up around divorced families and single parents and people who use drugs and I use drugs. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, people are flawed and complicated and we all fall short of our own ideals. But I do think that it's, it's probably better if the most influential and prominent members of society at least attempt to pay lip service to a good example 
um, even with the knowledge that, look, we're all flawed and we're all going to make mistakes, but still, like, there are certain ideals we should at least aim to, to strive for. You know, I, I've sometimes uh, suggested that I liked the, um, it, 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 there's, there's always going to be some degree of hypocrisy in society sure. on the part yeah. of whatever you want to call them, elites or, mm-hmm. or uh, the upper class. Um, but I like the, uh, the John F. Kennedy model of hypocrisy more so than the kind we have now. Which is, you know, JFK, he was, he was a flawed man. And, but, but the image he presented to the American public was, you know, he's a good husband, a good father. He tried to do the right thing, so on and so forth. He was a war hero. They had this whole sort of mythology around him. But in his private life, we know that he was a philanderer and often an absentee father and all these, you know, all these, all these um, shortcomings. Um, but he paid lip service. He thought it was important to set an example for the public. And now I think we almost have the opposite, where now we have, um, there's, there's a, a Yale law professor, he wrote this great book, um, the, the Meritocracy Trap, um, a couple of years ago, uh, Daniel Markovitz, and he says that now our modern elites are non-practicing libertines. Uh, and what he means by that is most uh, educated people today um, live very sort of bourgeois conventional lives um they get married and they have kids and you know for the most part they live a very sort of stable conventional life but if you ask them their opinions and attitudes around family around marriage around um you know behavioral transgressions and so on they take a very sort of relaxed attitude um so you know they support libertinism but they're non-practicing you know they don't partake in it so so the, the hypocrisy is almost flipped where it yeah, used to be you pay lip service to conventional values, but you privately, you know, uh, <laughs> philander. Now you publicly support philandering, but privately uh, behave in a more conventional way. And so your thesis, which you go into a little bit more in the book, is that by, by sort of a, by the elites kind of espousing, mm-hmm. for example, that family formation doesn't matter, that mm-hmm. that actually has a trickle down effect and, and throughout the rest of the society. So that the elites who are off getting married and raising kids in two parent families are kind of passing on this, you know, this really significant privilege of having Mm -hmm. two married parents while Mm -hmm. kind of promoting something that we know is harmful, even if it seems fashionable somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's basically it. That the people who set the example, who, um, you know, kind of set the discourse and the conversation and what's what's interesting, what's trendy, um, you know, who set the standards around culture and policy. Um, you know, they I think for the most I don't think it's malicious. I think for the most part, it's just a kind of naivete and a kind of willingness to go along to conform and, you know, jump on the bandwagon. You know, a lot of people. uh in in academia who i i thought were perfectly sensible people there was this period of of uh suspension of uh reflection in 2020 where they were supporting the defund the police movement and that was just floored by that because i thought well you know if you live in a safe neighborhood and low crime area um or a gated community then you know you may not need police but you know, most people do um and so, so yeah, this was, um, and that was one, one, one example of this, of not really thinking through the, the policies that you happen to be supporting. And, and even if they, on the surface, seem sympathetic or compassionate, um, you know, consider what are the sort of second order consequences. Well, I think it's also the collapse of complexity. Hmm. I mean, there are problems in terms of law enforcement and how they do or do not serve various demographics. But the simplistic idea, well, then we should just eliminate it, (laughs) is is Mm. part of that mob psychology that that when large groups regress, that their capacity to think in complex ways also collapses, and then they're comforted by slogans. Mm. Defund Mm -hmm. the police is a three-word solution to an enormous complicated um, situation that varies state by state, city by city, community by community. And somehow it seems reassuring. Build Mm -hmm. the wall. (laughs) Defund the police. You know, these three-word slogans 
which, oh my goodness, well, it's that easy. That's all it will take. Mm -hmm. But again, when large groups are put under enough stress one way or another, they'll align with often ridiculously simplistic, almost childish solutions and actually try to implement them. And that's Mm -hmm. dangerous, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's that. um, and, And I think, yeah, it's, it's, to some extent, I understand politics works the way it works and you want to build a broad coalition and sometimes messages get simplified or diluted. But, um, you know, I, for people who, who hold some prominence and some influence in society, it's, uh, yeah, there, there should be a greater sense of responsibility there, I think, to add a bit of the nuance and the complexity and to, yeah, really um, consider how this will affect other people. And, you know, just to, just to bring this back around for a moment to um, some of the themes of, of the earlier parts of my book that, you know, one, one, one thing that I, I, I didn't really um, consider until I wrote those early chapters was how, um, well, how, how should I, I guess I can approach it from, well, essentially the point is that young children have no, you know, I mentioned they're completely powerless on a kind of individual level. Um, they don't they don't exert much agency in their own lives, um, which is for the most part correct. Because if you're a child, you're unsophisticated and immature, and you don't know what's best for you. And so you would hope that adults would do the right thing and um, provide care and guidance and so forth. But then also on a, on a political level, <laughs> children can't vote, and so they have no power there either. And so historically. Um, it's been a good thing that marginalized people um, have been able to unite and uh, advocate on behalf of their own interests. Um, You know, they have been able to um, vote and to exert pressure in various ways and so on and so forth. I think generally speaking, that's been a good thing. But children will never be able to do that. Um, They can't unite on behalf of their own interests. They are a kind of group that... um, experience the world in the same ways and they're historically mistreated in the same ways and, and all the kinds of things that, that all marginalized groups um, have suffered through, but they'll never be able to do what other groups have done um, on behalf of their own interests. And so that is something else to keep in mind is that adults really do have to um, bear in mind the level of responsibility we have for kids and, um, and recognize that you know, these kids will become adults and whatever experiences they have when they're kids, this will have some downstream consequences on society as a whole. Um, and so you know, that was another point that I made of, you know, most kids who grew up the way that I did, they don't turn out like me. They turn out like like some of my friends who were incarcerated and so on. It's poverty of imagination mm-hmm. that adults fail to imagine the experiences of children, fail to imagine the experiences of people who are not like them. Mm-hmm. And, and that collapse of imagination and this collapse into literalism, and as you were saying, libertinism, sensuality, the meeting of primal drives, I mean, all of those mm-hmm. things go to this collapse of imagination and consequently this um, diminishment of empathy. Because so much of the suffering that you experience, and children often do, is this interference with imagination that generates empathy. Mm. And that is often a sign both of the environmental problems as well as personal developmental problems in those adults. Mm. So it, it is a spectacularly complicated, both personal and societal issue. Mm. So you've mentioned the word policy several times. So I am kind of curious if you are working with any policymakers or if you yourself have a certain idea about policy changes that you think would be valuable to consider. Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not a policy wonk. Um, you know, I, I am more interested in of individual level behavioral change what can we do um at the kind of individual or or perhaps the family level um you know as far as policy goes i i have thought about this of you know have there been 
successful policy change that we could potentially implement? I mean, historically, has has anything sort of led to mass behavioral change in a positive direction? And and one thing that 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 comes to mind is um, the anti smoking campaigns um, of the eighties and the nineties. You know, I, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, if you traveled back to nineteen eighty and said something like, you know whatever 12 in the future 12 percent of americans will smoke cigarettes instead of whatever it was back then i think something on the order of 30 to 40 percent um i think that would have shocked a lot of people um but that was a sort of sustained public awareness campaign of the harmful effects of tobacco um and even when i was a kid in the 90s i would see these commercials it was like every third commercial smoking will kill you and <laughs> You know, it, it didn't stop me from smoking, but, but it, you know, it, it, does, it, it had an effect on someone um, and it did seem to work. Um, and in, even to this day, if you buy a pack of cigarettes, it still has a warning label on it. I mean, who doesn't know smoking is bad for you? But I think there's something to be said for sort of reinforcing the knowledge repeatedly. You can know something, but it's still helpful to just have it um, reinforced and repeated. And I think something like this maybe could be done for uh, for family formation, for example, of, you know, public awareness campaigns of, you know, if you a child in a who, who's raised by two married parents who uh, have a healthy relationship, um, they're X percent less likely to be incarcerated or X percent more likely to graduate from high school and, and so on and so forth, something like that. Um, I could imagine this would upset some people, so it would have to be framed in a delicate way, um, you know. And and so I think something like that might potentially be helpful. Um, but it is it's it's something you know that that's the only that's the only sort of policy related idea is a kind of public awareness campaign. Um, the other would be um, kind of and this isn't this isn't related to to, to policy, but just more people sharing their stories. Um, I'm hoping that my book may, uh, encourage other people out there with similar stories to share their experiences too. And, uh, you know, stories had a large effect on me when I was a kid. And so, you know, kids pay no attention to policy, but they will, um, pay attention to stories. And so I'm hoping more people will, will communicate their own experiences in that way too. I was thinking of J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy. Um, mm. It's a different kind of story, but it, this another young boy raised in, in environments that are tremendously averse and tragic. So mm. Mm. I think it's, there, is a, there is a willingness, as you're experiencing Vance's and I'm sure others, to hear and to listen and to see. Mm -hmm. and, mm. and how that's going to enter into the collective and what the collective will do in response to that remains to be seen. Mm, mm, yeah. This whole capacity to influence the collective consciousness of a country. I mean, this was something that the psychologists have been interested in a long time. And of course, the horrific example was you know, what we saw in uh, Germany mm. leading up to World War II. But this understanding that as media has continued to expand its influence, the ability to influence the connect, the collective grows for good or ill. Mm. But I remember the campaigns, for instance, in the 70s, there was an enormous anti-littering campaign. Oh, right. That was very, very effective. I mean, it looks bizarre to see somebody throw a bag of garbage out of their car window on the highway. That's like shocking now. When I was a kid, you drove down the highway, there was mountains of trash on most any highway you drove, uh, it, it, it was ubiquitous to see somebody throw up, you know, a God knows, a mattress, you know, out the window. Um, <laughs> and that's really changed. Mm -hmm. But there does have to be this feeling, often at a federal level, that there is a particular virtue. Yeah, yeah. It goes to the cultivation a, of virtue, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Just to the, the topic. Exactly. Yeah. The cultivation of a virtue and often relative to the collective, something that can be seen in a very concrete way. Don't mm -hmm. smoke, don't litter. Again, mm -hmm. very short slogans. Mm -hmm. But to be able to stimulate affect and be able to, um, I can still remember the anti-lettering commercials. I remember them too. In my mind. 
the weeping Indian at the side of the highway. Iconic. Totally iconic. And it changed, you know, uh, the nation. So I, mm. I, I feel into what you're saying. The difficulty, of course, is what is, what is the message that the unconscious of the nation will take in and mm. make their own? And, and by the way, if you haven't seen The Century of the Self, it's a fantastic BBC oh, yeah. series about right the the mm-hmm. birth of mass marketing, which interestingly was founded by Freud's nephew, who applied psychoanalytic theory, who was the one who convinced women that they should smoke as a symbol of establishing their freedom and taking power into their own hands. Mm-hmm. And then the massive amount of effort it has taken to unwind that that idea in the collective as mm. if the collective is its own psyche, mm. one great vast psychology. So mm. it, it's a challenge, isn't it? Well, and, and I think we're saying it's both uh, that there are things we can do at the macro or collective level, like, you know, anti-smoking campaigns, but those are designed to affect individuals. It's not policy. It's don't litter, don't smoke. And I think what we're seeing uh, now is the birth rate is declining in uh, the United States and in other so-called first world countries because people are making individual decisions uh, based on, oh my gosh, I, I don't think I'm ready to have children. I can't really afford to raise children in the way that they should be raised. Um, so those, that, that's been maybe a, an effect that is not altogether intended. Um, not, nonetheless, it's a trend hmm. of you, you don't just, you know, couple up when you're uh, you know, 19 or 25 years old and just go ahead and have a family anymore. Now it's a conscious decision for many people of, wait a minute. Uh, And people are putting off having children until they've got some uh, financial security or have really gained some traction in career. So Mm. I I see that as related somewhat to this um, and what we've bypassed in our discussion. And what I think is really difficult is Mm. social policy uh, Mm. because there are so many unintended consequences. And, uh, you know, how do we affect, how do we affect change? Yeah. Yeah. And and then there are people like us, right? Where we do it, uh, where there's a lot of individual work, but that's a big question. How do we affect change? Sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 no. I, uh, on this point of the the declining fertility rate, I, I just read this analysis in The Economist, which found that when they, when they separate the fertility rate by education level among women, they find that college educated women, their fertility rate actually hasn't changed that much in the past few decades that they're having children later in life, but the yeah. overall number of children remains roughly the same. Whereas for non-college educated women, for working class women, the fertility rate has, has completely collaped. And that is actually what's largely mm. responsible. And so, you know, I, I'm reading this and I'm thinking about my own life experiences. And there were various points in my childhood where I lived with, um, uh, teenage girls who were teen moms and those, their daughters are grown up now, uh, and they're in their twenties and they haven't had kids. Uh, and I myself am arguably an example of this where my mother was young when she had me and I don't have any children. Uh, and so, you know, I, I do wonder how much of this, um, you know, there are a variety of, of forces here, technology and education and, 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 and prolonged waiting and so on and so forth. But I, I do wonder how much of the attitudes around marriage have, have changed this and how much of the kind of, you know, we've, we've, we've talked about trauma of a generation ago. Um, if you were a, a young woman uh, from a working class background, um, a lot of these women would have children with men and, and hoped that that would actually lead them on a path to marriage with the father of their children. And most of the time that never happened. Um, and so they raised these kids as single parents, single moms. 
And those daughters grew up um, with their mom and no one else. And they never saw what a healthy relationship looked like, unlike their mom. So uh, the teen moms of a generation ago were raised by two parents. So they still held out the hope that, okay, well, if I'm, you know, I'm, I'm with this guy and we're sleeping together and I have a kid and maybe we just kind of attempt this and maybe it'll lead to something like marriage. And it never did. Those, their daughters grew up, their kids grew up and never even witnessed what marriage looked like, what a healthy relationship looked like. And so they're just not having kids at all. And the culture that they grew up in also didn't really prioritize marriage or, or, or communicate the importance of marriage. The vast majority of people still, if you ask them, um, you know, about their, about family formation, most people still want to be married before they have kids. Um, and so f- I'm, I'm, all of this is to say that I, I, I do wonder how much of the fertility crisis is actually a marriage crisis um, and how much of it is, is a result of, of, of the kind of trauma and, and stress of, of growing up in a, a family where, uh, you know, you've never actually seen what a healthy relationship looks like. Well, I hope that we've sort of been able, we've, we've traveled really widely <laughs> over this territory yeah. and I, and I hope we've, at, we've at least, uh, you know, done what, what we do, which is just open things up and, uh, begin a conversation about it and circumambulate it a little bit and look at it from, from different views. Thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you yes. for joining us. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rob. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.